Welcome, we are live. Dave, you want to get started? Yeah, thank you for having me. So what do you want to talk about? You can jump right in, talk about Barker House, anything that you want to say. Generally here to promote the book and, and talk about it. If anybody is out there, would like to, you know, maybe even ask something. We'll get you know, a little bit of back and forth going. So here's Barker House. This is the final copy for the final print. I started it in 2015. It's sort of, I know, Matt, you remember some of the fiction I was writing in workshop. And uh, I brought that with me to my MFA. And I had about 200 pages of a novel about a, a prison guard. And uh, my first workshop didn't go so well. A lot of the peers said it was boring. They didn't want to read 400 pages of that kind of material. And so I had a, a mentor, Jamie Attenberg. She wrote St. Maisie, The Middle Scenes. She said this would be cool if you wrote it in short vignettes instead of like a long, you know, 400 page book. So I took that and I just started writing like these five page like episodes that happened at the jail that I worked at. And then as that was happening, I couldn't, I couldn't restrain myself. So the five pages turned into 15, turned into 20. And then nine months later, I had a draft of the book. The next probably three months I spent with a mentor trying to figure out what to do with it. Cause I'd never queried an agent. I didn't even know the next step was an agent. I just thought I could send the book out to publishing houses and someone would just grab it. So I learned the whole process of querying an agent, which is sort of something I want to talk about. I think that's really daunting. Um, Honestly, that might be the most helpful thing too for people out there. What are those next steps? You've written the book or you've written a, at least a good chunk of it. Yeah. Well, I think the best thing to do is not rush. So you only get one shot at querying an agent. Um, so if your book isn't ready and you know one night you're just like, I'm done, I'm sending it out, and you haven't had anyone read it, no one's um, edited it or proofread it, and you send it out and it's a disaster, they're not even going, going to read it. They get you know a thousand submissions a week, the big agent. And so you might capture them in your query letter, and then they'll ask for maybe the first 50 pages. And if those are a mess, then you've, you've screwed your book with that agent. So I would say, take your time. I spent three months with a, with a mentor and we sort of just got it ready for a query. And so it's like one step at a time. The first step is finishing the book. The second step is getting it ready for an agent. And then the third step is querying. Um, and I still didn't even know what that meant. I, did, I had to Google a, a, how to write a query letter. I didn't even know how to do it. So there's a lot of resources online. Um, a lot of writers post their query letters. If anyone's interested, I would I would send you mine. There's no, it's not a secret, you know. Okay. It's like maybe we'll link it um, in in the video below when this goes to YouTube. Okay, cool. And it's also like, who do you query? There's a lot of agents out there, and not uh, all of them are good. Um, so. I looked at my favorite writers and then I just looked up who their agents were. And then I went to their website and they always have sort of their guidelines. Send us um, your query letter, sort of who you are and your first 10 pages, uh, or don't send us anything yet. Just send us your query letter and we'll ask you if we're interested for your next 10 pages, half manuscript. So you have to follow the guidelines and you have to make sure you know who you're addressing. They can tell if you're just doing a mass query, like I'm just going to query 50 people. Make sure you're addressing the right person. You're doing the, you're following their guidelines because all, all of them are different. So I queried eight agents. I shot for the moon. I went for like the big ones. I didn't hear back from seven. They just didn't even respond ever. Um, that, that's not like the literary magazine where they send you a rejection. If you don't hear from an agent in 30 days, they didn't want it. And they'll tell you that in their website. We don't have time to answer you. Um, we'll just, they just ghost you. <laughs> is, is, that Which I think is, is that worse in that scenario? Does it feel worse where, you know, at least you get some sort of rejection, even if it's a standard thing? You know, we have rejection wiki and we have tiered rejections on, on the whole lit mag thing. So I guess there, there might be some worth to it, but may, maybe it's worthless anyways. They're busy. Let them have their time. Yeah. Well, it's also though, I mean, it is harsh, but if you do get a response from an agent and they tell you, you know, we liked your book, it was just missing, it just missed the market for dystopian, um, or it just missed the market for, I know a, a few of my friends that wrote, they went, you know, to Iraq, Afghanistan, and they wrote a book when they got back, but like veteran lit past its window, the market's just like cluttered with it. So agents aren't interested anymore. So a lot of it's just luck. 
you know, um, that you just hit the market at the right time. But if an agent does tell you, you know, we liked it, we just have to pass because we can't sell it. You should know that your writing was good. Um, and at least you heard from them. You think it's yeah. a subject matter thing where they, they saw, you know, what Barker House was about and it was like, oh, maybe we can't, maybe this is too intense for some people. Yeah, I think so. Um, when, after I got the agent and we sent it out to publishing houses, the first few rejections were like, we wish this was nonfiction because content like this is sometimes too heavy for fiction readers. And nonfiction readers are used to content like this. They come for content that's heavy. And I was like, oh crap, maybe I'll just go back and write this as nonfiction. I kind of, my agent's like, well, slow down. You, you've only had like three rejections. Don't rewrite the whole book. So we just waited and finally we found Bloomsbury who said um, they picked it up because they liked that it was fiction that read like nonfiction. So they liked they liked it for the reasons it was getting rejected for. So I'm glad I didn't freak out and rewrite the whole book. I've been giving people, because I have a lot of friends that are querying agents, and I've been telling them to sort of the same thing, find your favorite author's agents. But one of the things with my agent is she had a small client list, but she was at a really big agency. So she was a new agent. So what I cared more about was like the letterhead um, of the agency. And then I found the youngest or the newest agent and queried her. Instead of querying, you know, Ellen Levine, who has 600 clients, I didn't want to be like bottom of her list. I wanted somebody that had a small list, but was still at a big agency. And so I tell all my friends that sort of find like the Wiley agency, which is big, but find like the most junior agent. Because they wouldn't be working there if they were bad agents. And they're also going to have a small list. So my agent was like, I was only number eight, I think, for her. So she was always available. Um, she never blew me off. I know there's some horror stories of people getting agents and they don't hear from them for months. You know how it is writing. You sort of want to know, like, what's up with my book? Like, what's going on? It's tough to go like six months without hearing anything. So I think that's what people should do if they're looking for an agent is sort of find the good agencies and find the newest agent who's hungry and who is building a client list. I think my agent now has 30 something clients. So what were you saying about what I was reading? Yeah, I, I think I had seen you tweet that you were reading a book from another author of the same agent that you have. Was that like a cool, a cool thing to see into, into that? Yeah. And it's, I mean, they're like winning awards too. So it's kind of crazy. Um, Gabriel Bumps, a uh, new book, uh, Claire Lombardo. Um, she just sold the rights to her book to Laura Dern at HBO, you know? So like, that's kind of crazy to see like writers that have the same age as me, like getting HBO deals. It's yeah. An exciting thing in itself. <laughs> yeah. That's like the goal, right? To like see your book on, on TV or like Netflix or something. That'd be awesome. I think we talked about that with Andre uh, too. You know, they have to start filming too. And there was something where, it, what was it? House of Sand and Fog. And it was just about to start filming. And like the day before it got pulled or something. And then uh, obviously that was eventually put out through somebody else and not non-James Franco related because it was going to be James Franco directing, which might have blown Andre totally up. I know. Like, he's such a big name. Uh, Franco, buy, he's buying the rights to a ton of books, um, dashing it and then waiting to like someday make it or produce it. But I didn't really know how that whole process worked of sort of selling a book as like a um, film or TV. If they if they option the book, you get paid no matter what, even if they never make it, which is kind of cool. You could just keep optioning your book. You know, I think he said The Garden of Last Days has been optioned like six times, <laughs> but it's never okay. it's never been made into anything. I think they have like two years there's usually something in the contract which says if we don't produce this in two years, the rights go back to you and then you can option it again somewhere else. The initial option money is low. You get the big check when they when it goes into production. That's when you sort of life changing money <laughs> kind of thing. If Barker House was going to be anything, it would be like a Netflix series. Yeah, that would be the, the perfect spot because it's broken up into nine different stories. So they can just have like nine episodes. <laughs> Whoa, you're selling uh can we add netflix when we uh put this out because <laughs> um this year netflix it was the first time they went to the frankfurt book festival in germany they sent a team and they were just buying up rights books like crazy because books do well on netflix when they get adapted 
so Netflix now has a team that's like just buying up books like crazy, um, which is kind of cool. I'm like, let's do it. Yeah, so um, I'd like I'd like to hear more about the the different perspectives and all these like stories and how uh how that like came together. I'm so interested in point of view and multiple point of view when you're getting all these different things and how that how that contrasts and everything works together. And I'm sure there's some sort of you know way it all fits together. I'm I'm excited to read because obviously I don't have my hands on the copy yet, but we'll be pre-ordering and uh, get my hands on it. Yeah, in like less three than a weeks. Month. Yeah, I think I just started writing the stories and I wasn't planning on linking them. Um, it was just going to be a book of short stories. And then narrators show up in other stories and then they have multiple stories. And so I just did like a storyboard where I just drew out all the stories and I spent like a day or two figuring out how to link them all through certain events. And there's one event, one character who sort of holds it all together. Everyone sort of has had an interaction with him. And he's sort of like, he has one story, but he's sort of like the climax of the book. So it's sort of all built around him, but it's not just about him. It's about the nine other narrators. So it has a cool feel. I got, I was inspired by A Visit from the Goon Squad by Jennifer Egan, where sort of you stay with a narrator for like 30 pages, you really start to care about them. And then you don't see them again. And then later in the book, they just pop up. And it's like, oh, Mikey, you know, and it's like, you get so excited to see them. So I sort of wanted to have that idea, like, let's get the the reader really interested in somebody and then like, take them away from them. And then in 100 pages, um, you have that like excitement when they return. So that's sort of how it came together. That's a cool uh, concept too, to uh, create that, you know, emotional distance. And then maybe you're like the contrast creating with somebody else. You go to the next character and you're like, oh, I kind of hate this guy. Can I read through this 40 pages and like get back to my dude and get back to the, <laughs> this other guy? But and... it was a risk. It was definitely a risk to take because I go in from first person and third person. Um, there's also a, a, a female narrator. So um, it's kind of jarring when you read first person for like 30 pages and then all of a sudden you're in third person and you're kind of like, who the hell is this now? You know? Um, and then it takes you like a page to figure out you're in someone else's head. So it was tricky to pull off. We decided to do, um, before each chapter, um, my editor decided to do, I don't know if you can see that. We put the narrator's name in. That way you know, like, okay, we've switched narrators. We know who they are. Um, I wasn't a big fan of that, but um, some of the first, like, readers that we sent early copies to, they were like, I need I need some footing here. It's too much. Um, I don't know who I am when I'm reading it. And so we had to sort of, we had to put that in. So are those chapter titles as well, or is it, like, the name gives you a little name and then the chapter titles, like, below that? Yeah, it's name, part of the jail, so it tells you the unit you're on. Cell block. And then, it, yeah, or the kitchen, or the booking department. And then it has, like, a short title. Um, before, I had, like, really long titles, and then we cut them down to just, like, two-word titles, which I was kind of bummed about. But a lot of times, you have to sort of give up the power. But, like, a lot of times, the other than knows better than you. And so... Um, when they say like short whenever. titles, you gotta you gotta go with it at that point, yeah. I was kind of like, well, let me see what you mean, you know. And then she showed me, and I was like, oh, that, that's actually kind of cool. Um, but she had this weird. My editor had this weird idea to do a cold open. So instead of seeing like a title page, you would just open the book, and it would just begin, and then it would be the first story, and then when that story ended, would be the title page, and it would almost be like a cold open to like a TV show. And we tried it and it didn't it didn't work. A few of the people that read it, they were like, no, this does not work at all. So that was like a crazy idea. So we, we threw like everything against the wall um, with this. We wanted it to be different and weird. It's really sort of challenging what a novel is. It's not a traditional novel. It has dialogues in it. So there's three chapters that are just dialogues between two guys um, where there's no action. They're just dramatic dialogues. and I never thought they'd let me do that in the book. So it's really a different type of book. How did Andre feel about the dialogue part? Well, I gave him a copy. He had me over for dinner at his house, and I gave him an early copy. And then he read it, and I I saw him like two months later, 
and he was like crying. He just like hugged me and he's like, I can't believe you pulled this off. So um, he loved the book. Uh, he talks a lot. He talked a lot about the the woman narrator, the female narrator, how I how I did that, because his father was one of the best at writing women from a male perspective, I think. Um, and that was the hardest chapter to pull off. We probably spent four or five months, my editor and I, on that chapter because we had to get it right or the book was going to fail. She's she's a, a major character. And uh, I'm glad I, I worked with all women on this book. My agent's a woman. My editor's a woman. The copy editor's a woman. Um, everybody that touched the book other than me was a woman. So, And the, I, this is the one female character in, in the entire book or is there like mentions or are there any maybe like foil characters that are you know she's the out? one narrator yeah there's wives there's girlfriends there's female inmates but this, this is the only a whole chap so we had to make sure that worked and she's also i think she's like the champion of the book she's probably one of the only characters that's worth rooting for in the end she has the, the sort she sort of owns the last chapter she's my favorite character i think but we had to make her we had to make her right my first few attempts at that it wasn't so i'm glad i worked with a good editor to sort of make her right was that the most difficult part of the book was getting that part right yeah we went back and forth a lot about her just because you know what's it like to be a woman officer in a male like jail you know what's and i was sort of missing that aspect of it so we had to really make sure that worked what would it be like having 96 men stare at you all day? And so that was what I was missing. The story itself was good, but I was missing sort of embodying like a female officer in those moments. That would, there was just like maybe two pages we had. To, we went back and forth for a few weeks on, like making sure every word was right. And that, that's, that chapter is being published in the Yale Review next month as an excerpt. That's yeah. fantastic. Hey, well, send me the link to that too. And that'll be uh, anything that we mention and stuff. I'll try to link below in the video. So when people watch this later, they'll be able to, you know, explore a little bit more and stuff. But in the Yale, Rev how did that, how did that happen? That's fantastic. I know my agent sent, I mean, my editor sent a few chapters just to get extra publicity to publish excerpts. And uh, we have one coming out in the common. Um, we had one in Guernica. We just had one in Salem and we don't want to you know publish the whole book before it comes out in magazines um and then right when she pulled them Yale Review said wait we want we want one so it was sort of a last minute thing and she's like what do you think I'm like hell yeah the Yale, are you kidding me it's like one of the oldest literary magazines but it was funny because I worked with the editor there and she made a ton of edits to the story that was already finished in the book so I'm like these are gonna look different you know like it's not going to look the same and i kind of liked her edits and i was like oh can we go back and <laughs> and fix it and my editor's like no your book's already in, at the press like it's being printed now but that was sort of a weird thing to be editing a story that was already printed in in the final book <laughs> so they're going to look a bit different but yeah they wanted the it's called property so they wanted that that story um which is cool that's fantastic and guernica too yeah we i mean that was my first story I ever published. My edit, my agent spent about a year sending the stories out and getting rejections. And then I was like, okay, let's, should we start trying the publishing houses now? And so we decided let's publish, let's try to get one story published. So when we go to the publishing houses, it doesn't look like, you know, we have some cred. And so Guernica was the first one. And right when they accepted the story, that's when we decided to send the book out to all the publishing houses. So we did a first round of like the big five, all their imprints, and we got about seven or eight rejections there. And then eight just didn't respond. So we, I was kind of, I was like, this book's not going to get published because it was about a month and a half. No one wanted it. So my agent said, okay, let's do round two of like the lesser houses but it was still like Tin House, Bloomsbury, Riverhead. So um, right when we sent out round two, Bloomsbury answered like within two days. And I, honestly, I only knew Bloomsbury from like Harry Potter. So they published the first Harry Potter book from J.K. Rowling and that's where they made. So they were a small house. They published Harry Potter and that's when that's how they got huge. So I didn't really, 
I never read a book from Bloomsbury other than Harry Potter. And then when I looked at their catalog, I realized like they published Jesmyn Ward, Salvage the Bones, won the National Book Award. So they published like a lot of a lot of big books. They sent me this one I'm reading now, The Apartment by Teddy Wang. And uh, this comes out, I believe, next Tuesday. And he's another one that sort of, he's, this is his fourth book. The book is really good. It takes place in 1996 MFA um, at Columbia. And it's two guys that it's, uh, it's about a friendship between two guys that meet there. And so, I mean, they're publishing a lot of fiction now. I think they have a refocus on fiction. So I think in the coming years, we're going to see a lot of Bloomsbury books in the fiction category. They, they stress nonfiction for a while, but I think now they're refocusing and rebranding as a big fiction house, which is cool. I think some people lean away from that creative nonfiction as well, just because they're like, oh, I want to, you know, get into something that doesn't have to be real. People are reading to separate themselves from reality. So maybe, maybe that's like the fear too. And some, as you were noting earlier, some places weren't liking it because it was reading like that, but Bloomsbury liked it because it read like that. Yeah. And I think that's sort of what people want now too. Is, um, there's a lot of auto fiction is sort of a big genre right now. Um, so auto fiction would be like me writing a book. The narrator is David Maloney, but I work at like a slaughterhouse and you know, it's, it's like me, but not me, which is kind of weird. Joshua Cohn did it. Um, in the book of numbers, the narrator is him, but it's not him. And a lot of auto fiction would be the opposite, where it's a real story, except you change all the names and you change just a little bit of the story to make it fiction. Sort of what I kind of did with my book, except I fictionalized a lot of the stories. A lot of the early stories that I was writing, they were true, but they were boring. They were only true because I knew them to be true, but I had to just go back and add a little bit of like twist or spice to them and fictionalize them. And that's when they started making people, you know, excited. But the first drafts were, were good gritty stories. They just, they were landing flat on everyone. So then I had to really dive in and just say like, let's just fictionalize this whole thing. Let's just start making shit up. And so that's what I did. But it's sort of like nonfiction, I think sells really well, but it's because a lot of like the heavy hitters, like Michelle Obama's book sold like three or four million copies. So that adds a little bit of uh, of weight to the nonfiction side. But nonfiction does sell well, but the world is like, like right now we're in the middle of a pandemic. No one wants to read like heavy stuff, you know, that's actually real. So fiction, I think right now is a good escape. Right. It's a good time to buy a book. <laughs> you were talking to somebody else yesterday that woman Rob, robin call and she was like i'm not sure if this is beach reading material and i was like yeah you can get away with reading anything on a beach i've read stranger things on the beach before yeah i read crime and punishment when i was in my mfa it's like people walking by me and i was reading crime and punishment <laughs> on the beach so yeah you can get away with reading kind of anything that's true <laughs> It's been a pleasure to have you on. You're so honest about everything and you have all these great, you know, I'm learning things. And if I'm learning things, <laughs> other people are, are definitely out there and everyone's curious about how, you know, I've written a book. What's the next step? All the stuff with querying agents and, and everything that you've been talking about today is just crucial information and I'm sure it's going to end up helping somebody. And that's the whole idea with, with my channel. Somebody dives in a little bit more and they find this video and they listen to all these different authors' perspectives. Do you have any uh, you have any closing thoughts? No, they. I think you're doing cool stuff here and thanks. Maybe you'll have other authors on because of this uh, pandemic. We're all losing our tour dates. My entire tour is canceled everything every event uh, my book launch is canceled so this kind of stuff helps because you know we rely on especially a debut i was relying on those on those tour stops and book you know bookstore readings and i was reading at three different colleges that's not happening so thank you for for doing this for having me on um i appreciate it big time absolutely maybe, maybe there will be some time when i've figured out discord a little bit better so a good thing about this is you can add like a bunch of people in and, you know, have a, like a big active dialogue. It would be nice if we got James in at the same time. So that was like our, you know, yeah, squad that we all study awesome. with Andre and stuff. And that's, that's obviously how we know each other. I should, we should have maybe dove into that a little before too, but it's good to have a network and just try to create a network and, uh, and learn from people and keep an open mind. 
try to help each other all in it together. Yeah, we should get like a Brady Bunch screen going, you know, get like six people on. That'd be cool. That could be spicy. I've seen it done. I've seen it done before. It's been a pleasure, my friend. Thank you for coming out. Author David Maloney, everybody. All right, Dave, we'll catch up soon. All right. Thanks, Matt. Cheers, my friend. Adios.